an article in The Guardian written for Easter 2018 uh, stated that these abundant historical references leave us with little reasonable doubt that Jesus lived and died. The more interesting question, which goes beyond history and objective fact, is whether Jesus died and lived. The Christian faith is centred on a person. It's centred on a point and on an event in history. <clears throat> and this is a claim that the New Testament makes. In a letter written 2,000 years ago by a man called Paul, uh, he was writing to Christians in a place called Corinth and he's addressing the fact that some people had turned up in the church and are claiming that Jesus did not come back from the dead. And Paul's reply in this letter is, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Paul is telling us that if Jesus didn't come back from the dead, then we're wasting our time. Our faith is useless. We may as well pack up and go home, sell our building and split the profits between us because the Christian faith is centred on Jesus. It's centred on who he was, it's centred on what he said and it's centred on what he did, particularly on his death and resurrection. And so truth matters. You know, we're living in an interesting time when it comes to the truth. For a while, uh, we've been told that there is no such thing as absolute truth. We are told that truth is relative, that one thing can be true for you, but another thing can be true for me. And there is a sense in which we've seen some of the consequences of that idea in the last six or seven years in British and American politics. But surely these years have shown us, if we were in any doubt, that truth is not relative and that truth really does matter. And they've shown us some of the dangers of spreading and believing lies. This is now Peter's second letter. And one of the reasons uh, that he is writing is because he knows that soon he is going to die. And he wants his readers to remember and to firmly hold on to the truth. Some people have turned up in the church and are claiming that the things that Peter has been saying about Jesus didn't actually happen. Instead, they are cleverly devised stories. But Peter wants to remind them that he was an eyewitness. He was an ear witness to the things that he's talking about. He actually saw them happen with his eyes. He actually heard the words spoken with his own ears. And he remembers that Jesus had actually warned his disciples that this was going to happen, that false teachers would come. And so this was no surprise to Peter. And he wants to warn his readers so that they will be alert to this danger. And so we need to be alert to this danger too. Obviously in Peter's day, most of these false teachers would have to literally turn up and join in with the congregation. But today we have access to so much information, whether it's good old fashioned books and magazines or articles on the internet or sermons and talks that we can watch and listen to on YouTube. And so how do we make sure that we're not being led astray by false teaching? Before we go any further, it's helpful to note that when it comes to our faith, there are some beliefs that would be classed as essential and others that are non-essential. And therefore, it's not necessary to look to agree with someone on absolutely everything in terms of the way that they understand the Bible. I've said uh, many times uh, before that we never simply do something because it is written in the Bible. The Bible was written in a culture and a time that is very different to ours. It wasn't written in English. And therefore, every time we read the Bible, and we need to go through a process of interpretation and application. What did it mean then? And so therefore, what does it mean for me today? And that's a process that requires humility, prayer and the work of the Holy Spirit. And at the heart of the essentials is Jesus. 
when we're on the lookout for false teachers or when we're concerned that something we're hearing might not be true. My starting point is always, well, what do they say about Jesus? Do they believe that Jesus, as portrayed in the Gospels, really existed? Do they believe that he was God, that he performed miracles, that he died on a cross, was buried and came back to life three days later? Do they believe that Jesus is the only way to God or is Jesus simply one of many possible routes? Do they believe that Jesus is coming again? These are the essentials. They were essential for Peter, who was an eyewitness, and they need to be essentials and non-negotiables for us too. And then Peter wants us to know that false teaching often won't be obvious because it is mixed in with the truth. Peter talks about it being secretly introduced. When someone comes claiming that Jesus didn't really die and rise again, then that's a fairly easy heresy to spot. But false teaching is often more difficult to spot because of the truth that's mixed in with it. And therefore we need to be alert and on our guard. It would seem as if many of the false teachers that Peter had in mind are living in ways that don't live up with a godly life. He talks about uh, reveling in their pleasures with eyes full of adultery. Now, obviously, no teacher is perfect and we all sin, but it seems that these false teachers are blatant and unrepentant in the way that they live. And when they're confronted with their sin, there is no sense of repentance. And so they are giving people a license to sin. Not only are they living an ungodly life, but they are encouraging others to do that too, both through their example and through their false teaching. Several times Peter talks about greed and exploitation, and whilst it might not be so prevalent in this country, because of the reach of the internet, we need to be on our guard whenever we hear someone offering God's grace in return for cash. And it's important that we know our sources. One of Peter's claims to his readers is that he's an eyewitness. And so why are they choosing to listen to someone else who is saying something different? They weren't there, but Peter was. And so do we know who we are listening to? Who is this author? Who is this preacher, this conference speaker? What do I know about them? Where do they come from? What have they said in the past? I think it is good for us to read authors and to listen to speakers who may not agree with us on the non-essentials. Asking questions and being asked questions about what I believe is a good thing. Being made to think about my faith is a good thing. You know, someone said something along the lines of, you can safely assume that you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. Is being surrounded by people who think just like me means that my behaviour is never challenged. So it will be necessary to do a bit of homework. But over time, we will begin to build up a list of trusted sources, certain websites that you know that you can trust, certain speakers that you know that you can trust, certain authors that you know that you can trust. Last Christmas, I had uh, a great video that I wanted to use for one of our online services, but I thought I'd better do a bit of digging because I'd never heard of this person before. And then after a link to a link to a link, I established that this video was coming out of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, also known as the Mormons. And without that digging, it would be very easy to go from one video to another video to another video. And without realising it, you're suddenly, uh, you're suddenly having things presented as the truth, even though they are not in the Bible. Earlier on in the week, one of my friends posted something on Facebook that said, uh, truth does not mind being questioned. A lie does not like being challenged. And there was no reference to suggest where it may have come from. But there is a lot of truth in that statement. And if I ever say anything that you disagree with, I would hope 
that you'd get in touch. Preferably not straight away. Maybe the first thing would be to examine your own position. Check out what you believe. Check out why you believe that. What does the Bible say? But then if you're still in disagreement, get in touch. Let's sit down together with a coffee and with the Bible and humbly study the Bible together. Not looking to win the argument, but to better hear from God. And as a part of our background research into the teachers we're listening to on the internet or the bloggers that we read, whose authority are they under? Are they part of a church network? Who are they accountable to? Now, one of the dangers of the Internet is that it is a place where anyone can set up anything totally independent of anyone else. And the Internet is full of ministries which come about when one individual fell out with one Orthodox Christian group or another because of something that was contrary to the teaching of the Bible. And rather than come to a place of repentance and reconciliation, they were able to set up their own ministry that goes on to damage others. Now, we only read parts of 2 Peter 2 earlier on, but I would encourage you to go away and to read the whole thing. In fact, start from chapter 1 and verse 12. But even in the verses that we read, we get the sense that this is something that God takes very, very seriously. Just look through this chapter and see the number of references that there are to judgment. And if we were to get nothing else from the chapter as we read it through, surely you'd pick up that God is going to punish false teachers. And part of that is because of their role in pulling people away from the truth. People who are desperate to grow in their faith and yet they're being pulled away because of these false teachers. God takes it very seriously and therefore we need to take it seriously. Jesus claims to be the truth, whereas the devil is described as the father of lies, which is why truth matters. False teachers will come, but let's not be deceived. Let's recognise and hold on to the truth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for Jesus and we thank you for your word and for the Gospels, uh, for where we can read about the things that Jesus did, the things that Jesus said. We thank you that we read there of his death, his burial and his resurrection. And Lord, we thank you that because of these events that took place in history, we can know forgiveness we can know your love, we can know peace, we can know purpose, we can know hope. And Lord, I pray that you would help us as we seek to engage with your word, as we seek to get to know you better. Help us to know the truth and to be able to identify false teaching. Watch over us and protect us and give us wisdom. And we thank you that you you don't leave us on our own, but you put us in a community. And so together, I pray that we would learn, we would identify the truth and we would grow as we seek to be disciples, becoming more like Jesus and seeing lives transformed. Amen. <laughs>